Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to tonight's City Council meeting. Today is Tuesday, September 18th, and we're certainly pleased to have everybody here. Uh, we'll start with a uh, roll call of our City Council. Council Members Entman. Here. Erpenbach. Here. Jamison. Here. Karski. Here. Rolfing. Here. Staggers. Present. Aguilar. Here. Anderson Jr. Here. Well, thank you very much, Lori. Uh, we'll begin our council, as we always do, with uh, an invocation. We're very, very pleased to have Pastor Phil Tagg of the Ransom Church here in, in downtown Sioux Falls. Uh, just a, a brief little rundown on, on the Ransom Church. They moved to downtown Sioux Falls um, back in December with about 350 to 400 uh, people attending on a, on a regular basis. They have now doubled that and uh, it's, it's only September. So uh, great things happen in, in downtown with, with the Ransom Church and Pastor Phil Tagg is, is leading the way. Um, we will have our, our prayer. And then if I could ask you to remain standing for a Pledge of Allegiance, I would appreciate it. Pastor Tag. Let's pray. Father, what a rare privilege it is to call ourselves your servants and to serve in the capacities and the roles that you have laid out for us. And as I've been praying in my own life daily, Father, for the leaders in this room, bring them humility, bring them focus, and bring them wisdom. Help them humbly handle the matters that are before them, uh, never bringing uh, their own uh, biases and opinions in, but just trying to represent the people well. Help them be wise in the choices that they make that represent our city, and help them not lose the focus on uh, the vision that they have for this city and the direction they want to take it into the future. And so we pray these things for these leaders. We pray these things for this meeting in your name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Well, thank you. We'll now move on to tonight's uh, consent agenda. Could I recuse myself? You bet. Councilor Rolfing is going to recuse himself from, uh, from this. Um, Council, any, any changes, motions? Move to approve Anderson. Second Entman. Councilor Anderson Jr. has made a motion to approve tonight's consent agenda, seconded by Councilor Entman. Uh, any discussion? A roll call vote, please. Council members Entman? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Jamison? Yes. Karski? Yes. Staggers? Yes. Aguilar? Yes. Anderson? Yes. That is passed 7 to 0. Now move on to tonight's regular agenda. Uh, Council, any changes or recommendations? Move to approve Erpenbach. Second Anderson. Councilor Erpenbach's made a motion to approve tonight's regular agenda, seconded by Councilor Anderson, Jr. Uh, any discussion? Mr. Mayor. Yes, Councilor Erpenbach. I need to make a, an amendment to the regular agenda. I'm going to amend item 25, transfer of 2012 retail wine license. We're going to strike the word wine and change it to the words malt beverage. So it's transfer of 2012 retail malt beverage license and the remaining wording. Very good. Is there a second? Second, Entman. Uh, Councilor Box made a motion uh, to amend uh, the regular agenda, item 25, to change the word wine to malt beverage, and that was seconded by uh, Councilor Entman. Uh, any other discussion? A uh, roll call vote, please. Yeah. Council members Entman? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Jamison? Yes. Karski? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Staggers? Yes. Aguilar? Yes. Anderson Jr.? Yes. The amendment is passed 8 to 0. Any other changes? <clears throat> Very good. Uh, could we have a roll call vote on the amended uh, uh, agenda? Council members Entman? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Karski? Yes. Ralphing? Yes. Staggers? Yes. Aguilar? Yes. Anderson Jr.? Yes. That has passed 8 to 0. Thank you. Uh, well, folks, again, welcome to tonight's meeting. We're certainly pleased to have everybody here. Uh, wanted to see if anybody wanted to speak to the council. And, and if you do, just come on forward, uh, state your name, and the council would ask you to limit your comments to five minutes or less. Welcome. Good evening. Uh, my name is Tracy Sabo, and uh, thank you for allowing me to talk to you tonight. Um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about public-private partnerships. Um, it seems like 
I, I hear this all the time. Everybody talks about this as a great panacea, to, it's a successful way to get things done. Uh, I, I think you might be hearing a skewed view, and I kind of think maybe you need to hear the other side. I think it depends on what we mean by successful, what we mean by getting things done, and uh, who's paying to get that thing done. Um, Public-private partnerships, they're nothing new. It might be a relatively new word, but the concept really goes back centuries. Um, in fact, according to Mussolini, the definition of fascism, or the third way, was the merging of big business and big government. So um, in Mussolini's mind, this was sort of a compromise between free market and socialist philosophies. The government still gets to control things, businesses still get to make money, as long as the businesses do what the government wants. And other businesses get taxed and they fail. Um, it's not a new concept. Um, in fact, 200 years before that, the same philosophy that Mussolini thought he invented was called mercantilism. <laughs> and again, through subsidies, which we do a lot around here, monopoly grants of privilege, licensure, and other sorts of partnerships with private actors, those determine what was and what wasn't done. And Adam Smith wrote Wealth of Nations explaining why we don't need government picking and choosing what projects we need. The government doesn't need to be making decisions about whether we need tennis courts or businesses downtown or whatever. Individuals can make those decisions and make them better than you can. Um, and uh, what's interesting, though, is that when you read Karl Marx's Communist Manifesto, I know, complete opposite spectrum, right, from uh, Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations, um, when you actually read it, all of his examples about how evil capitalism is, they're actually examples of what, what Adam Smith would call mercantilism. Again, big business and big government partnership. Uh, there's a reason why both socialists and free market advocates are opposed to these public-private partnerships, and it's because historically, the only people who get wealth redistributed to them are the politically connected wealthy that have access to government. Um, the only thing the public gets are the losses. And there's numerous examples of this in our city. The pavilion, for instance, private people helped to fund that. Um, they made some money, but now that it's not making money and it's a sinkhole, the taxpayers are paying for the losses. Um, the same thing is going to happen with the swimming pools, the ice centers, tennis courts. If they make any money at all, you know, the people that, the private people that invested money in it, they're going to make some money. But if it generates loss, guess who gets to pick up the tab? the individual. And unfortunately, it, I mean, it's not like these things are going to be free. It's not like I get to go use it for free because of the taxes that you're taking from me. You're going to be charging fees to it. You have to. There's no way around that. Um, the, the core program is another per perfect example of this philosophy. Why is the city deciding the downtown is so important that it's okay to steal from businesses and private individuals who aren't so politically connected and giving corporate welfare to businesses downtown? I was actually kind of surprised that people like, like Erpenbach and Aguilar, who are supposedly these great liberals that believe in protecting the little guy, are supporting corporate welfare, or socialism for rich people, as I like to call it. Um, the Green Bay Project is another example of this. Why are we paying to increase property values of big businesses who are already wealthy? Um, let people spend their own money the way they want to, and don't take it from me. Um, the diversity center is another good example. Um, we all heard the testimony here last week of the way these people were treated. You can be sure that if the diversity center had to raise its own money on its own and they weren't on the public dole, they would have better customer service and better vendor relation services. Um, the only way to solve that problem and straighten that place out is to get them off the dole and stop subsidizing them, let them fail or succeed on their own. And if they can't succeed, well, then they're not doing a good enough job. Um, Public-private partnerships are nothing new. They're nothing more than wealth transfers from the poor to the wealthy. It, it's the worst kind of socialism. And uh, the council seriously needs to start thinking some new ways of doing things, because this method is not sustainable, not in the long run. Thank you. Well, I Thank you. Question. Uh, if I, how much time do I have? Uh, you've got about 27 seconds. How come the council doesn't ask questions back to people when they make statements? I used to, um, I used to come to these quite often, and people would ask me questions as I was talking, and there would be a little bit of uh, discussion 
with the individual as they were talking. And this past, I've probably been to the last five or six of these meetings and I don't see any correspondence at all. You know, there was one time I was talking and you guys were talking amongst yourselves and I thought that was kind of rude. And, uh, you know, maybe if you were able to ask me questions immediately, you wouldn't get bored while I was talking to you. I, <laughs> it's just a question that I have. Why, why don't you guys do that anymore? Mr. Sable, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Uh, so this no is answer. an opportunity for the You're public welcome. to engage the council. And uh, that's how it's been set up. Uh, the council uh, certainly wants uh, an opportunity to listen and learn from the public that they serve. And this is the forum uh, th that, uh, that they've identified. Um, and, it, and we think it's been effective. Mr. Weinerman, welcome. <coughs> Thank you. You're Council welcome. Mayor. Uh, I'm Mr. Weiderman from Sioux Falls. I'm not here to chastise you, but I would like to know one thing. Why do we hear Sanford and why do we hear Mary Uther and why do we hear Sanford and Sanford? There's three huge come and goes being invested, in, put in this town, and nobody knows about it. Nobody has taken the initiative. The newspaper didn't even know about it. Six, uh, but somewhere around a total of $30 million has been invested by come and go in three brand new come and goes in this town. And then you talk about uh, the gentleman that just spoke. Why do we have to have a tennis court where you're going to have to pay $22 to use it? That's absurd. Go out to one of the fitness centers. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Weiderman. Welcome. Tim Stanga. I just want to know where all the people are that were here last week. It's pretty empty. <clears throat> but then again, they got their money that they came for last week, so they're done with their agenda, and we won't see them within five or ten years when they want us to take over all their facilities that we financed or put money towards. I guess my question is, and I'm going to sort of hit the same way he is. You know, with the city council and the mayor's office, we don't hesitate on giving TIF money out to anybody that wants to build downtown. We don't have a problem putting money into the Greenway downtown. We don't have problems putting money into a water feature that we don't even know what it's going to cost the citizens to run every year. We put, uh, if I'm correct, a sprinkler system uh, on 8th Street that all the plants are irrigated. So. Have we figured out what that's going to cost the citizens of Sioux Falls to irrigate all the plants on uh, 8th Street? But when it comes down to doing something for the public, like snow gates or being able to trim trees, everybody sort of sticks their nose up and says, Whew, boy, that's not going to do anything for the city. Well, my question is, are we here for special interests or are we here for the people of Sioux Falls? That's one thing that uh, we lack, is being there for everybody in Sioux Falls, not just special interests. We can have all the tennis courts, we can have anything we want, but don't you think everybody should be happy? Not just a certain group of people. Seems like uh, we're gonna start going after landlords again. You know, it seems like every year we gotta come after the landlords, but yet we don't come after tenants that trash places and don't take care of them. It's not always up to the landlord, but I'm hoping that when the mayor comes down on the landlords at Sanford, McKinnon, and all realtor-owned properties are dealt with, and not just the little guy. Because Sanford and McKinnon and all the realtors, you're going to find out that they're probably 75% of the problem. My mom wanted me to tell uh, Jameson thank you for uh, going to... Uh, the food giveaway. One thing I find out at the food giveaway, it's a reality check. It shows that there's two sides of Sioux Falls. You can come into the city council meetings and Mr. Turback will come up here, not knocking him, but uh, he'll tell you how great Sioux Falls is doing and oh, unemployment is at 4% and everything's taxes up, but yet you go out to the food giveaway 
and you look at what people are, or how people are struggling, that's just a reality check. Because when unemployment is 4%, we don't look at how many people dropped off the unemployment roll that are living in mom and dad's basement because they can't find a job or they can't find a job that they can live on. Or you have husband and wife that have two jobs and never see each other when they walk out the door. And the only time they see each other is when they say good night. We wonder why our children, why we have problems with children in town because you can't keep parents at home to discipline the child and plus being able to watch the children as they're at home after school. You know, I think the town could do a lot more for the citizens of Sioux Falls than what they're doing now. And I'm hoping that someday, and I don't know when it's going to be, if it's going to be in my lifetime, but I'm hoping that the city steps up and starts doing stuff for the public and starts realizing that there are people that are suffering and that it's time that the city starts realizing what's really going on in this town. Thank you. Folks, anybody else want to speak to the council? Welcome. Honorable Mayor, Council members, my name is Mark Williamson and I am the commander of the Sioux Falls chapter of the Military Order of the Purple Heart. My organization is one of the many military organizations comprising the Sioux Falls Veterans Council. I am here tonight as a member of a committee assigned by the Vets Council to look into the possibility of constructing a permanent memorial inside the confines of the new Vets Center to honor the over 100,000 American service personnel who have either been held as a prisoner of war or declared missing in action since the beginning of America's conflicts. We have provided you with a, <laughs> Kenny, that's a, with a small red book. Basically it has some pictures of a proposed project that we would like to see constructed inside the event center honoring the POWs, MIAs. There's not a whole heck of a lot to it. It's bound to be stark, you know, just as what the conditions they served under. And uh, this is only a sample. It may not reflect the final memorial. It naturally will depend upon your approval of the project and the location inside the facility. My purpose for appearing before you tonight is to plant the seed of thought within you as to what a tribute the city of Sioux Falls could provide to those who have contributed so much to the welfare of our great nation. Costs of the material and labor will be provided upon approval of our proposal, but we figure it shouldn't run any more than eight to ten thousand dollars. Thank you, Semper Fi. <laughs> Thank you, Mark, very much. We appreciate it. Uh, folks, anybody else want to engage the council? Well, thank you very much for being here tonight. We certainly appreciate it. We'll now move on to item number 20. All right, item 20 is a new 2012 retail wine license for Sam Nang Chen and Sarum Elk Phnom Penh restaurant to be operated at 1010 North Minnesota Avenue with a special use permit being approved on May 13, 2005, pending final inspection per health. 21, new 2012 retail wine license for Sam Nang Chen and Sarum Elk Phnom Penh Restaurant to be operated at 1010 North Minnesota Avenue with a special use permit being approved on May 13, 2005, pending final inspection per health. 22 is a new 2012-2013 package malt beverage license for Come and Go LC. Come and Go number 620 to be operated at 412 North Sycamore. 23 is a new 2012-13 package malt beverage license for Come and Go LC, Come and Go number 631 to be operated at 1400 North Cliff Avenue. 24 is a new 2012 package liquor license for Come and Go LC, Come and Go number 631 to be operated at 1400 North Cliff Avenue. 25 is transfer of a retail malt beverage license from Utopia LLC, Falls Overlook Cafe, 825 North Weber to Capo LLC Acoustic 196 East 6th Street Suite 101 effective October 21 2012 pending final inspection per health item 26 transfer of a 2012 retail wine license from Utopia LLC Falls Overlook Cafe 
825 North Weber Avenue to Capo LLC Acoustic 196 East 6th Street Suite 101 effective October 21 2012 pending final inspection per health 27 special one day liquor license for hy V Inc all occasions by hy V to be operated at the point is to serve church 506 North Kiwanis Avenue for a wedding reception on October 20 2012 and item 28, special one-day wine license request for Downtown Sioux Falls, Inc. for the first Friday wine walk to be held on October 5, 2012 at the following locations, 8th and Railroad Center Lobby, 401 East 8th Street, Bead Company, 319 South Phillips Avenue, Cookie Jar, 125 West 10th Street, East Bank Yoga, 401 East 8th Street, number 220, Great Outdoor Store, 201 East 10th Street, Kaladis, 200 South Phillips Avenue, Lillian Shop, 311 South Phillips Avenue, Suite 101, Oh My Cupcakes, 524 North Main Avenue, number 106. Rayfields Art and Framing, 210 South Phillips Avenue. Rug and Relic, 401 East 8th Street, number 114. Sticks and Steel, 401 East 8th Street, number 118. Young and Richards, 222 South Phillips Avenue. And Zanbros at 209 South Phillips Avenue. Um, Lori, thank you very much. Yes, and I can answer questions on these tonight. Jamie is not able to be at the meeting. Thank you. Council, any questions or motions? Move for approval, Anderson. Second, Entman. Councilor Anderson Jr. has made a motion to, to approve these items. Seconded by Councilor Entman. Uh, any discussion? <coughs> Very good. Uh, a roll call vote, please. Council members Entman? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Karski? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Staggers? Yes. Aguilar? Yes. Anderson Jr.? Yes. Thank you. That is passed 8 to 0. Item 29. This is the first reading, an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, providing supplemental appropriations to fund the 2012 COLA adjustments, $680,942. Mayor, Evening. City Council, Bill. Bill O'Toole from Human Resources. Uh, this supplemental appropriation really comes down to a timing issue uh, for us uh, when we adopted the 2012 budget. Uh, if you recall, the 2012 budget was adopted um, by resolution on September 12th, 2011. Uh, and during that time, we were still wrapping up negotiations with, with each of our three respective labor unions. Uh, we, the last um, labor union that, that we finished negotiating with uh, was AFSME and FOP, and that resolution adopted those agreements on December 5th. Uh, the fire contract was adopted uh, a little bit sooner, and that was done in, in November 21st of 2011. All of that predated the adoption uh, of the uh, 2012 budget. Uh, and I believe at the time we talked about the um, uh, labor contract approval, we had indicated there's a good chance that we'd be coming back this fall for a supplement uh, for that 2% COLA. Uh, because in addition to the AFSM employees uh, where that was negotiated, there were also other groups that were affected by that 2% COLA, including the classified employees, mid-management employees, and the appointed employees. Uh, so this appropriation is to deal with that 2% uh, uh, COLA uh, for 2012. Now, I, I also want to clarify that um, with the if this is adopted uh, tonight, there isn't any new raises that are going to be uh, processed as a result of this. The COLA went into effect in January 2012. Um, and a natural question would be is if, if we adopt this money and it's not expended, what would happen to those dollars? Uh, and those dollars would revert back to the unreserved fund balance. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. And Tracy Turbeck is also here as well if there are additional questions on um, this first reading. Thank you, Bill. Council, any questions of Mr. O'Toole? Councilor Staggers. Yes, uh, Bill, um, this, we call it a COLA. Uh, many people would call it a pay increase. But the, the you said this went into effect in January of That's, this last January, right? I guess I'm still wondering, here we are in September, why it wasn't adopted back in January or February or whatever? I, I guess in hindsight, Councilor, it's, it's possible it could have uh, been done back then. I think one of the things that we wanted to do was get a sense of how the year was progressing uh, and whether or not we could look at the budget and its operations and see whether or not we could mitigate some of that uh, throughout the year. I do know that, for example, you won't see in this appropriation uh, anything that to deal with uh, increases for those uh, non-bargaining unit employees in police and fire. Um, mm -hmm. We believe the budgets in those respective departments are enough to absorb uh, the costs uh, there. Uh, so that was part of the thought process, Councillor. 
Okay, so, so if I could just clarify. Yes. Basically, it was just, hey, we're hoping we can maybe absorb it with, uh, with the budgets of the different organizations, but we weren't able to, and so now we have to do it now. Well, some of fair? it. Some of it. And, and obviously, as we're looking at going out through the end of the year, um, you know, again, we, we knew that we didn't appropriate any dollars for that 2%. Um, we looked at how the year was progressing, and at, at this point, it's our belief that we need to do this at, at this point. Uh, I'm not going to sit here and say that every department will expend every last penny of that, but if that doesn't happen, it, it will revert back to the unreserved fund balance. Okay. Thank you. Well, Council, thank you. Uh, I don't know if anybody would want to set a date of hearing and second reading for Tuesday, October 2nd for this item. So moved, Aguilar. Second, Karski. Councilor Aguilar has made a motion to <coughs> set that hearing and second reading, and it was seconded by Councilor Karski. Uh, any, any further comments? If not, a roll call vote, please. Council Members Entman? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Karski? Yes. Ralphing? Yes. Staggers? Yes. Aguilar? Yes. Anderson Jr.? Yes. Thank you. That is passed 8 to 0. Item number 30. First reading an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, amending the revised ordinances of the city by revising section 15 and a half dash 5, fees for parking. Good evening, Darren Smith, Director of Community Development and Public Parking. Uh, the ordinance uh, that we are requesting to be amended, very simply what this accomplishes is uh, giving the public parking system the flexibility to lower uh, rates in our ramps and surface lots, either temporarily or permanently. Um, as you look through the ordinance that's in front of you to, uh, with the request to be amended, um, uh, in my opinion, this ordinance, when it was written way back when and as it continued to be amended over the years, was just, was just written poorly and uh, should, have been, uh, should have been cleaned up uh, prior to this. But, uh, so we're accomplishing that as well. Uh, but at the end of the day, what this amendment does is that it gives us flexibility to lower rates in our ramps and surface lots. And so I want to make it clear that uh, nothing proposed to be changed with this ordinance would allow us to raise rates in our lots or ramps one penny without city council approval. It's only to lower uh, rates at our discretion. And if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer questions. Matt Nelson, our public parking manager, is here as well. Councilor Staggers. Yeah, I just got a technical question, Darren. Mm -hmm. So let's suppose you um, lower the rates. I'm just going to make these numbers up from sure. $10 to $5. So you don't need any ordinance or anything like that or approval from the uh, city council. But you're down at 5 and you think, uh-oh, maybe we should go back to 10. Will you have to have our approval or can you do that okay? No, I believe we'd have the ability to do that because if you look at the ordinance, uh, the changes in the very first section, Section A, uh, state that the fees shall not exceed the following for parking in city parking ramps and lots and then it goes on to specifically identify the amounts that we charge today in each in each lot and each ramp so we can go up to that amount okay. yeah Councilman Buck why in the world would you lower parking rates Darren I don't I mean I'm all about making more money right what's the deal sure. <laughs> well, I, uh, I would remind uh, the council that the public parking system is an enterprise fund, so we function very much like a small business inside a city government. And what we would really like the ability and the opportunity to do, like any business would, is to look at those lots and ramps, uh, which is our product, in effect, our inventory. Um, we'd like to look at those lots and ramps that are underperforming at times and be able to lower rates, uh, run specials, promotions, those types of things. Again, like any business would, if they have a product that's moving slowly, uh, we'd like the ability to do that. And right now, we don't have that ability. The amounts are in concrete, and we cannot raise them up or down one penny, which, again, in my opinion, should not have been structured that way. Thank you. Well, Council, again, thank you for the dialogue. Um, would anybody want to set a date of hearing and second reading for Tuesday, October 2nd for item 30? So moved, Rolfing. Second, Anderson. Councilor Rolfing's made that motion, seconded by Councilor Anderson, Jr. Uh, if there is no further discussion, a roll call vote, please. 
Council members Entman? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Karski? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Staggers? Yes. Aguilar? Yes. Anderson Jr. Yes. Thank you. That is passed eight to zero. Item thirty one. A resolution of the City of Sioux Falls approving the preliminary plan of LOPE addition. Planning Commission recommends approval. Mike Cooper, Planning and Building Services. This is a petition submitted by TJN Enterprises Incorporated. And this is the site that we have been working with them on for over a year for their metal processing and recycling facility. As you recall, this has gone through extensive review in the past including an appeal of a conditional use permit, which was upheld by the City Council. This is a 25-acre site, and it is on East Rice Street, just past uh, Great Bear Recreation Park. The property is served by the Ellison Eastern Railroad. And as a point of reference, it is just across Rice Street from the proposed site of the Burlington Northern Santa Fe and Ellison Eastern Interchange that Director Mark Cotter discussed with you earlier today as part of our rail relocation project. Uh, this is the subdivision plan, which is my, kind of the final step in the process before the property can be platted and then ownership transferred and then building permits would be issued. And just one final point in terms of background, if you recall, this is part of a three-way agreement that's being worked on between PESCA Construction, the current owner of the Stockyards property, XL Energy, which is the current owner of this 25 acres, and TG and Enterprises. And with this exchange between XL Energy and PESCA Construction and TJN, the 25 acres will be exchanged for 15 acres of the Stockyard site, and that 15 acres of the stockyard site will be utilized by XL Energy to construct a new switching station, substation, excuse me, substation, which will eventually replace the one that's over next to Falls Park. So, since we don't have much to talk about, I thought I would go on a little bit. Sounds good, Mike. Sorry about that. <laughs> and then, Mike, would you mind relaying to the council and to the public then what happens with the, uh, the old switching station? Uh, yeah, the current substation would be substation, reverted. Substation, switching station, yes. sorry. Oh. The current substation by Falls Park would revert it, uh, donated back to the city and turn into open space as part of Falls Park. Thank you, Mike. Before I have the council engage uh, this topic, is there anyone in the audience who wanted to speak to this item? Very good. Council, questions? Or, yes, Councilor Jameson. Mike, the uh, property at the uh, old stockyards, <clears throat> which part of that will be uh, converted into the uh, substation? It's going to be a 15-acre parcel kind of in the very middle of the stockyard site. And then uh, along the east side of Weber Avenue, we're currently working with a group of uh, citizens to potentially acquire three to five acres and uh, donate money to build a park uh, to remember the old stockyard site. And then the balance of the stockyard's property is currently being looked at for other industrial or economic development. I think that's a perfect uh, transition from that Morrell's property and across the street and the whole stockyard, the whole thing is a great transition there at that substation and then that park and as we move. So I, I really like that plan. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Rolfing. Mike, just to help me with my uh, memory, which is, seems to be going, but where is that substation right now? Is that straight north of, of Falls Park? It's directly east of the Overlook Cafe. Okay. When you go okay. by there. That's right. That's, that's right. right. Next to the Overlook so Cafe. So that'll help with the view and everything. That's right. Okay. Thank you. Well, very good. Uh, thank you, Council. Um, would anybody want to make a motion to approve this item? So move, Anderson. Second, Karski. Councilor Anderson Jr. has made that motion, seconded by Councilor Karski. Uh, if there is no further discussion, a roll call vote, please. Council members Entman? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Karski? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Staggers? Yes. Aguilar? Yes. Anderson Jr.? Yes. Thank you. That is passed 8 to 0. Item 32. A resolution restricting lawn watering.
Good evening, Mayor, City Council, Mark Cotter with the Office of Public Works. Um, this resolution tonight um, is to formalize the city on August 29th when from odd even water restrictions to once a week. Um, Public Works was doing our homework as we continue to see the water levels in the Big Sur River decline and we had a major oversight that we changed the water regulation in the community when we determined or through the research found out that the only people that can do that is in this body. So we apologize for that oversight and tonight this resolution would formalize that change in water restriction. Thank you, Mark. Again, uh, an opportunity for the, uh, anyone in the audience to engage the council. Mr. Sable, welcome. Hello, Tracy. My name is Tracy Sable again. Thank I you, don't, Tracy. I'm not really going to tell you one way or the other whether you should do this or not. I, you know, I, I just kind of want to make the comment that uh, you know, if we actually had a market in this city, and I don't know how we would go about doing that, um, but if we actually had a market in the city for the production of water instead of a government monopoly, um, competition and uh, supply and demand, you know, could, could set the price in such a way so that, um, you know, when we start to have less water, you know, prices could raise, and when we have less, when more water, prices could lower, and, uh, you know, the price could could solve this dispute between how much supply we have and how much demand we have for the water. Um, and then we wouldn't need to write regulations and laws and fine people and, and uh, use, use all of this, uh, you know, government to force people to, to do what they need to do to, to, we wouldn't need to use regulations to solve this problem of having high demand and low supply, we could, we could let the pricing structure um, figure that out through competition and the dis agreements between individuals and their whatever voluntary provider they want to use to serve water to them. So I would suggest in the long run that uh, we tr try to figure out how to do that so that in the future, you know, we don't we can, we can minimize bureaucracy and not have these problems that we're having right now of having to rewrite laws and things like that. Thank, Thank you, Tracy. Ms. Weiderman, welcome. I really hadn't planned to come back up here, but this okay. is, uh, I'm Ayo Weiderman from Sioux Falls. I don't understand this at all. How many millions of dollars did we give to the Lewis and Clark to bring water into Sioux Falls. And it's my understanding we're online, so why are we restricting our water? Uh, that's fair. Mark, would you mind uh, addressing that for Mr. Weiderman and, and the people of Sioux Falls, please? Uh, certainly. We had a good discussion at the informational meeting just to build off that. Um, the plan that we have in place that we have made a commitment to update this fall really looks at the flow in the Big Sioux River as our first source of how we manage water restrictions. Um, we have to recognize that Sioux Falls has four uh, water sources, two are um, ground sources, two are, um, one is a surface water and then the fourth is an import source. There's two aquifers north of Sioux Falls, the Big Sioux River and the Middle Skunk Creek. There's the Big Sioux River and now we're importing water from Lewis and Clark. We've only been importing water from Lewis and Clark when we made this change for just at 30 days. We continue to make operational changes to accept that water. Um, and long term, Lewis and Clark is, is our, our long term water source. But we truly can't um, uh, not look at the flow in the Big Sioux River as an indication of just how dry this entire region is. From here to Watertown, um, it's extremely dry. Today, the flow in the Big Sioux River is at 32 cubic feet per second. Um, year to date, we're about 6.2 inches below precip, and the river continues to trend lower. Um, we do recognize that Lewis and Clark has come in a very timely point. In the contracts that we wrote with Lewis and Clark, we said we needed water by 2012. It came in 2012. So did a persistent drought that continues for us. There's not a finite amount of water 
Um, we still recommend to manage the water system very conservatively so it's sustainable for generations to come. Mark and Council, I apologize. I'll be on. Would you just explain to the Council as well as to the people of Sioux Falls what happens when the river reaches 20 CFS or lower? When the river reaches 20 CFS or lower, by our water rights, we can no longer harvest water out of the Big Sioux River. And so now we, out of the four sources that we normally get water from, now we're down to three. And truly the, the key question is how long will this drought last? And one of, the, one of the considerations that Lewis and Clark gives us right now is it allows us to somewhat relax on the amount of water we're harvesting out of the aquifer so we can let that rest if this drought continues to persist for a long period of time. I think we also have to recognize that Lewis and Clark's only been online for now 50 days and they could have an interruption in their system and we want to make sure that we don't put all our eggs in that basket until um, they truly get through all their startup uh, transitions and we get through all of our operational startup transitions accepting their water. Thank you, Mark. Councilor Staggers. Yeah, Mark, I, I guess one of the concerns I have is we're, we're talking a lot about a drought and so forth and mm -hmm. the, the um, uh, decreased flow of the Big Sioux River, and that's appropriate. But also, I guess I'm concerned that we do have another drought, and that other drought is we're not using our full allocation from Lewis and Clark of the 17 million, 17 million gallons per day. We're only at 10 million today uh, from Lewis and Clark. Mm -hmm. We should be focusing on trying to get the others, well, yeah, buying the remaining 7 million. And in the process of buying the other 17 million, unbeknownst to many people, we would be paying less money for the Lewis and Clark water than what we produce it for. Because right now we're producing what? A dollar one for every um, 1,000 gallons. If we got the full 17 million from Lewis and Clark, we'd be paying 93 cents per 1,000 gallons. So I guess my question is, instead of focusing on this idea of more restrictions and so forth, why aren't we focusing on getting our full allocation from Lewis and Clark, paying less money for the water, and at the same time also making Lewis and Clark happy? Um, it's still the most competitive source that we have is to harvest our own water. It's our well field is in place, our plant is in place, and truly that's the way that we deliver water to the central zone of Sioux Falls. Um, Lewis and Clark was purchased as our long-term water source, which is really um, to um, deliver water to the growth of the city as we bought this um, 2050 water system, which is in our high pressure zone on the outside of the city. Um, and so it's, it's, a, it's a technical question on how you uh, receive that amount of water, but we've stepped it up um, and now we're into 10 million gallons per day. Um, and we continue to make those operational changes to accept that water. Mark, I, I just to try to um, follow up on Councilor Staggers, because I, I, um, I think the question that Councilor Staggers asked was, could you today receive, do you have the cap capacity to receive the 17 million gallons that Councilor Staggers talked about? I think that was question number two. And then question number one was, would it be more um, competitive in terms of a price uh, if you were to do that versus using the, um, the aquifer or the Big Sioux River today? I may have Greg speak to the price. Greg. Um, and uh, today from the delivery standpoint, um, there is, there's a staged approach in how we're taking this water. Today we have an allocation of 17 million gallons per day. Um, we have two different pressure zones. And so for us to uh, move water into that central pressure zone, it takes uh, connections, takes PRV valves, um, and so today we can probably take about 12 million gallons per day of that 17. And then as we continue to make operational changes in how we move water from the high pressure zone into the core, which is the low pressure zone, then we can steadily work our way up to that full allocation. But again, this is, uh, it's imported water. It's, we've been here for 50 days. And so we're continuing to make some of those changes to make those adjustments. Mark, thank you. I think that answers yeah. the second one. Greg, if you could uh, answer Councilor Stager's first one in terms of the, um, uh, would it be a, a more advantageous in terms of price um, if, if we were able to uh, receive that $17 million? Uh, Greg Anderson, Water Superintendent. Um, based on the calculations that I have been going over, 
as we purchase water from Lewis and Clark at a higher volume, the price does decrease. But in the same respect, the less water we produce at the plant, the cost of our water goes up. So there's an offsetting factor. So if we're making 27 million gallons a day and we bought 17 from Lewis and Clark and we produce 10 from the plant, our cost at the plant would really escalate to make that 10 million because of all the debt service, capital, operating, and things that go in to operating the facility. So there's, there's a trade-off. So the revenue we would lose here, we would gain here, it would be a, pretty close to a wash. Also, Sayers? Yeah, also, too, uh, we've been talking, uh, Mark, you mentioned about the different pressure zones and we have to re do this and do that. When's that going to be done? I mean, I, I thought that in July when we got the water from Lewis and Clark, everything would be, you know, taken care of with Lewis and Clark and we would be using Lewis and Clark water without having to worry about, you know, whether it's 12 million gallons or, or whatever the case might be. Accepting Lewis and Clark is a learning experience for the City of Sioux Falls Water Department. Uh, we have two connections that take Lewis and Clark into the city. For us to be so bold as to say we could automatically take 17 million, we would be putting ourselves in jeopardy. So we're taking this in a stepped process so that we don't make any mistakes that cause a problem that would break something that would cost more to fix it than what it would be worth to try to push it. So we're doing this in a stepped approach, plus Lewis and Clark is running on a very small staff of operators and they are basically pushed to the limits right now so if we were to escalate that we would escalate them and then maybe they would break something that they wouldn't want to break so we're working together taking this in a stepped approach and sooner or later we will get there when we need to be there so if I could just one more time no ask. take your time yeah we're taking a stepped approach to bring 17 million, when are we going to be done with the stepped approach? I guess I didn't realize we were in a deadline to do that. Councilor Mbach. A couple of things, Mr. Mayor. Number one, as a city council member, I'm I'm charged, and all of us are charged with with policy, making policy and, and appropriating funds to see that that policy is carried out. Um, micromanaging the water system is not um, creating policy. That being said, um, Mark and Greg, I, I want to go back to the conservation measures that are in ordinance. That, and I, I appreciate you coming forward and saying, yeah, we goofed, and we really should have had you do this first. In the meantime, some of us, me being one of them, watered on the wrong days. How many of us were ticketed during that time when the department had decided that they were doing the right thing and council hadn't approved it? What punishments were meted out during that time? Um, well, we do focus on education, so no citations were wrote. Um, at the time that we discovered this um, last week, there had been about 100 phone calls from either one neighbor or someone driving by that called the water department. They immediately follow up. Um, so we can get those corrected, but no citations have been uh, issued. Okay. Then to my credit, I watered my mom's lawn on the wrong day too, so I figured it balanced out. But then would you remind us what is the, um, what is the new rule that, we have, that we're about to vote on? Okay, very good. If I can get your address, we'll swing yeah. by in the morning. <laughs> um, Tomorrow is my day. <laughs> right. Um, once a week watering, there's a schedule that's followed. It's on our website, but I can read it. If the last digit of your address is zero, you water on Mondays. If it's one, you water on Tuesdays. If it's two or three, you water on Wednesdays. Four is Thursday. Five is Friday. Saturday is six and seven. And then Sunday is eight and nine. My watering day is on Sunday. So, um, But those, those um, days are also... Um, on our website if anyone has any questions after tonight. Councilor Jameson. Yeah, I don't want to uh, dwell on this too much, but it is kind of a continuation of the 4 o'clock uh, informational meeting, which this councilor finds extremely interesting myself. 
and as one of our most valuable resources, I think it's imperative that the council fully understand how it's managed. Mm -hmm. uh, the Sioux River replenishes which aquifer? The Big Sioux River has a direct connection to the Big Sioux River aquifer. So I think I'm picking up on this, the fact that if the river slows down, it won't regenerate that aquifer, and you can actually store water in the aquifer. So if the river runs dry and we've filled up our aquifer, we're better off. And that's where you're after, I think, right? That's right. We're, we're essentially relaxing that aquifer because we could go into a uh, very extensive drought. And we want to make sure that our sources that are closest and lowest costs are in position to serve the city. I get it. Good job. Thank you, Councillor. Well, very good. Uh, very good dialogue. Good question, uh, Mr. Weiderman. And um, with that in mind, let's have a roll call vote, please. We need a motion and a second, please. Oh, there hasn't been a motion? Oh, my Don't gosh. Don't move, Rolfing. I, I apologize, uh, Council and <laughs> City of Sioux Falls. Uh, Councilor Rolfing has made that motion. And Aguilar. And it was seconded by Councilor Aguilar. Thank you, uh, Lori, for keeping yes. me going. I appreciate it. Uh, there has been a motion, and it has been seconded. If there is no further discussion, a roll call vote, please. All right. Council members Entenmann? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Jamison? Yes. Karski? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Staggers? No. Aguilar? Yes. Anderson, Jr.? Yes. That is passed 7 to 1. Uh, very good. Uh, Council, any new business? Move to adjourn. Erpenbach? Good. Second Entenmann. It's been a motion to adjourn tonight's meeting, and it has been seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Very good. It is passed. Uh, thank you so much, Council. Thank you, City of Sioux Falls, for your attentiveness tonight, uh, and make it a great night. This meeting is adjourned.